When you eat your own, put me up. When you drive your car, up I go in flames. Every facet of your modern life depends on me. That's my claim to fame. How does it feel to be choking on the air that's black and smoky? You could change, but you won't. Uh, my absolute honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, after getting my start as a nuclear advocate, Teak 4 was my first, and I met uh, some friends there that I consider great friends today and probably will be for the rest of my life, um, other than John, uh, with one exception. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, yeah, two, three years, and we'll probably call it good. We had a good run. A friend of mine sent me a Facebook message. He said, Eric, check this out. We might be able to power the future with dismantled nuclear weapons and nuclear waste. I was uh, you know, very skeptical of that claim, but of course, jumped into the video. I started planning to go to grad school to, to learn how to organize and advocate for nuclear technology. Um, and, and that was part of my plan. But in the meantime, I wrote a few of these arias um, about, about nuclear, advanced nuclear, and, uh, and climate change. And one of them uh, was to the tune of Votre Toast, the very famous Toreador aria uh, from Carmen. And uh, a couple years ago, I had the pleasure to sing that in Paris uh, while uh, myself and two Finnish authors, Rowley and Jana uh, uh, Korhonen, a couple Finns, uh, tried to hand out 5,000 copies of their book, Climate Gamble, Our Anti-Nuclear Environmentalists Endangering Our Future. Spoiler alert, they are. <laughs> One person can't do this alone. We needed to build an army to be successful here. Uh, so after completing grad school, doing a little bit of organizing, uh, you know, working with Environmental Progress out, out in California for a while, organizing some marches with, with Heather and uh, the Mothers for Nuclear, I realized that uh, we needed an, an organization dedicated to building that grassroots movement, building a constituency for nuclear that will, that will go to bat for it, that will show up and, and testify on its behalf, that will contact their legislators. We needed that, and that wasn't being built anywhere else. So I called up the only person I knew who, who could even, you know, who, who, who had the ability to make that a reality, and that was, that was my good friend, Taylor Stevenson, uh, Tay. I don't come from the nuclear, a nuclear background. I'm, I'm a political advocate. I've been doing political advocacy uh, since I was 17 years old. I have been a nuclear fan my entire life. Um, I'm, I'm a Democrat, and I'm one of the very few pro-nuclear Democrats that's been on a ballot in Minnesota. Uh, it's just something that I'm passionate about just because as we've explored the last two days and as has been said many times, it just makes sense. 
You just do the math, right? This is very logical, very pragmatic, right? But there's a problem, right? If it's that pragmatic, if it gets that logical, why are more people not just in love with this technology in the same way that we are? So this is actually the question that we've really been exploring at Generation Atomic since Eric and I started this. Uh, some of you guys probably recognize this as the face of nuclear. And I mean, there's a reason for this, right? We, like, there, there are reasons why we are where we're at right now. There's a reason why we're having these conversations. For, for years, particularly those of you who work within the nuclear industry uh, or are directly related through the nuclear community, uh, you have been told for decades, literally longer than anyone who works for Generation Atomic has been alive, you, you have been told to keep your head down, keep your mouth shut, your story doesn't matter, nothing matters. As Heather said in her presentation, all that matters is don't screw up. Don't screw up. As long as you push the right button, as long as you, you know, submit the right documents, as long as you push the right papers around, it's someone else's job to be an advocate for nuclear. We, we have some 27-year-old in a, in a pencil skirt in the marketing department. That's her job, right? Your job in, the, in nuclear is to keep your mouth shut and keep your head down. And people will just eventually come around in nuclear. Well, we did that for 30, 40 years. This is what we find. This is the result of that strategy. We, we sowed those seeds. This is now what we, have, what we are reaping. Uh, you know, you see solar and wind, which has had a tremendous grassroots movement. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there weren't you didn't have people from the Sierra Club putting up independent billboards talking about wind. You had a couple of wing nuts who were digging uh, solar, uh, solar panels out of the trash in Texas and trying to install them on roofs because they cared about the technology. And then we had this thing that, inv that came up called Facebook and some people started to get together and eventually it just rolled and by word of mouth, it turned into a movement. And now, when we talk about clean energy standards, it seems insane to think of a clean energy standard without the so-called renewables, right? Without wind and solar. This is why there's a global poll. 85% of respondents said, yes, solar energy. We should, we should power our society with solar energy. We approve of that energy technology. 78% wind. 28% said nuclear. 2% more people responded and said, you know, when we were going to power our society, I think what we should rather do is burn oil. Just let that sink in for a second. You guys are allowed to laugh, by the way, during this. I'm, I'm actually very hilarious. <laughs> no, but seriously, like 2% more people believe that it is a better way to power our society by, by burning to like carbon based toxic sludge, essentially, than a clean, abundant, safe source of energy that is always on, right? This isn't a technology problem. This is a perception problem very clearly. And we see, again, now, when you have a perception problem, then you have a policy problem. And Meredith Angwin, I'm sure you, you, can, you see one up there that's near and dear to your heart. It's not just that we've lost the power production that is equivalent to all of our solar generation, and that's a tragedy in and of itself. But every single one of those colors on the left, San Onofre, Crystal River, Vermont, Yankee, Kiwani, Fort Calhoun, every single one of those represents people who have lost their jobs, represents children who have, uh, who have developed childhood asthma as a result of particulate matter in the air, uh, seniors who, ha who go through their life or maybe lose their life early because of, again, carbon-based sources that have polluted the air, and on and on. These are communities that have been destroyed simply because of a perception problem. I'm not going to divulge who said it or what utility they work for or anything like that, but understand this is a vice president of a major utility company that owns nuclear technology, a lot of it said this in a meeting after Eric and I gave, gave our presentation about what we felt Generation Atomic needed to do to help save the nuclear industry. And this is where we're at right now. 
Like this is where we find ourselves. This is the moment that we're in. These are the new faces of nuclear. This is Amelia Tiemann. Next to her in this picture is Charlie Hansler. This guy has taken people out of a homeless shelter. He's taken people who don't ha even have a high school education and he has trained them to go out on doors and talk to people about nuclear energy. This is Grant Hasbrook. Pretty much anything you see graphically, Grant does. The logo in the, in the bottom right, he designed. In the face in the corner there is John Landers. He's our state coordinator in Ohio. This is Sam Brewer. He's our tech manager. If you go online, if, you download it, if you've downloaded our app, if you haven't, by the way, shame on you, uh, download our app. Sam runs all of this. This is Ethan. He's getting elementary and middle school students from around the Perry Nuclear Station to sign postcards and be activists. How many of you have ever uh, written a letter advocating for nuclear to one of your elected representatives? Ethan knew barely nothing about nuclear when he started with us. We went through, he went through a two-day training program and went out on the doors and was immediately getting dozens of people to sign down and support. We also have volunteers. This is Emily Humes. Early on in Generation Atomic, we were still working with our clipboard. We hadn't fully integrated our app yet. It wasn't paid at all. She'd never knocked on a door in her life. Neither had any of her classmates who drove down from State College to Pittsburgh that weekend when we knocked on 400 doors in neighborhoods around Pittsburgh and talked to them about nuclear. Eric and I are not Generation Atomic. We're just two wing nuts who believe in the environment. It's the people that are affected by this. That's why we exist. And this is what we've done. This is four months in Ohio. We've talked to over 6,000 people, had a conversation, a substantive conversation with 6,000 people about nuclear energy. Almost 4,000 of those people have, when we've spoken to them, have signed down as supporters. We see about 60% of the people that we talk to sign down in support, uh, in support, and what, it mean, what I mean by support isn't, they don't just say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm all about nuclear. They actually give their name, they give their contact information, and by and large, in fact, more often than not, they will do some type of leg just legislative ad advocacy. They will write a postcard to their legislator and advocate for pro-nuclear legislation. Just about four out of every five people we talk to in Ohio believe in keeping the nuclear power stations open. We've all been told, keep your head down, keep your head buried in the sand, and nuclear will come out on top eventually. We're all told that the, the public is against nuclear and that there's just no way to change it. Like, we just have to invent a better technology. We just need to make a better box, and eventually they'll come over. It's not true. And you know how I know this? Because we actually go out and ask people. We go outside, we knock on their doors, and we ask them point blank, do you want to keep these, these plants open? Four out of five want to keep these plants open. There is support out there, we just have to ask for it. And it's not just about the environment. Most of these people, they see the community benefits. They see the jobs. They see the senior reactor operator who is also a Sunday school uh, teacher at the local church. They see the security personnel, the, the security officer, who not only has been a, an active wrestling coach in the community, uh, and, and had one generation, but now he's got a second generation of kids coming through who have also learned wrestling from him. The reason why these kids were at Perry signing down cards and support is they literally were telling their legislator, I'm in middle school, I don't have a vote, but 85% of my school funding comes from, that, from this plant we're standing right next to. Please keep it open so that I can stay in school. There are lots of reasons that people support nuclear. You have to meet them where they're at. People are willing to act. You just have to ask them. You guys are all probably thinking, well, what is Generation Atomic doing that has all of these people supporting nuclear? I've never seen this kind of support before. These numbers are astounding. What we do is we give people relevant information and we let them just talk to other people as people. That's it. I know, shocking, right? come without judgment and come without pretense and don't come to educate but rather come to inform, we actually find that people are willing to talk and engage in a simple two minute, three minute conversation is all it takes. It's all it takes to convert someone into someone who maybe is opposed to nuclear or doesn't have a particularly strong opinion about nuclear into uh, a dedicated supporter uh, who is willing to sign down. 
a little bit of what we're going to be doing today in the workshops is giving you flavors of that. But to kind of give you a primer, what I want to do is put this in context for you uh, that I think at least some of you will understand. Those of you who don't understand it uh, will benefit regardless from it. Uh, so I want to compare becoming a nuclear advocate to going out on a date. So you can all imagine sitting across a table from, like, from a beautiful woman like this. Uh, or uh, for those of you maybe interested in a, a slightly different flavor, maybe something like one of these fine gentlemen. <laughs> so first of all, you would want to lead with positives. It's hard for me to imagine that if you started a date by saying, hi, my name is Tay, and by the way, no one in the United States has died as a result of having dinner with me. I don't think that that's going to go the way that you want it to, right? But yet, what are we constantly told in terms of how to message about nuclear? No, nobody in the United States has died as a result of nuclear. That's our lead-in. That's our, that's our banner headline is nobody has died. Why in the world are we talking about, you know, radioactive sludge and three-eyed fish? And all, why are we bringing that up when really that's not what we're passionate about? I mean, nobody is here because they are really excited about not having died because of the energy that they're consuming. People are here because of other things. I'm here uh, because I'm an environmentalist and I believe in this message, right? So I'm gonna talk about my environmental passions. I'm gonna talk about hike, the hiking I like to do. I'm gonna talk about the desalination properties that I think are right. And I mean, I just was on the ocean, so I'm gonna talk about ocean acidification. These are things that I'm passionate about. And these are challenges that are met by an incredible technology. And how does that change the dynamic of the conversation? When all of a sudden we're talking in positive terms. And not only that, we're letting people share their own values. We don't come to the door and say, hi, I'm Tay Stevenson and I'm here because I'm an environmentalist and I hope that you will agree with me that nuclear is good because of environmental reasons. No, because what if that person, like we have, and I, I hand to the Bible, swear to God, we have had people on the door say, well, you know, that global warming hoax, you know, yet they've signed down as a supporter of nuclear. Now, the reason why is we always meet people wherever that we're not trying to be deceptive. But at the same time, people have different values. Some people care about the environment, but a lot more people actually care about the jobs in the community. A lot of people who have children or grandchildren care about the schools. And a lot of people, quite frankly, when we ask them, which of these things do you care most about? They just say, well, I care about all of them. And then we just have a conversation. Why education? Oh, I have a three-year-old. You know what? Actually, my dad was a teacher. I care about education too. Now we've connected on values. We're not talking just solely about us. We're not just talking about why we are passionate. We're connecting with people who have not been invited into the nuclear conversation. We're talking about what they care about. You need to be able to tell your story and be yourself. I find that a lot of people, when I'm, when I'm running an advocacy seminar, when I'm teaching, like, so for example, I was at Penn State, and I was having, like, there were a couple of guys that I had just a lovely conversation with. Uh, we were talking one-on-one, -on -one and they were it's very engaging, very smart uh, nuclear engineers, right? I know, shocking, right? Very engaging nuclear engineers seem a little oxymoron, but I, I promise you, these guys actually had, they had social skills. They were great. <laughs> Yet, I brought them up in front of the class, or in front, of, in front of the classroom, and said, you know, tell your nuclear story. And they were like, what do I do with my hands? Like, they just kind of like walked around and like, they just kind of like wandered over this way and started thought. They, they had no idea what to do because they felt like activism must be this like other thing. It must be something outside of them, like some activity that they'd never been taught how to do, as opposed to, again, simply just telling their story. And, it's not unsurprising for years when you have been told nothing but keep your head down, you don't matter. Your individuality doesn't matter. What matters is you don't screw up. Why would people think that they should, that they should be themselves and, and tell their story? Well, that's not what, what matters to people. When, when, when we have canvassers on doors, they can spout all the facts they want, but if, they don't, if the person at the door doesn't trust the person delivering the message, it doesn't matter. Engineers constantly want to know, and they constantly want to explain. I understand that. I have a similar condition. It's called having a degree in philosophy, 
right? <laughs> like, I, I get it. I get, the, I get the need to want to know everything, but trust me, it's okay. And it's actually very humanizing to say, I don't know the answer. I really don't know. But it's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. I will find out and I'll get back to you. It's an extremely powerful thing. So for those of you who are not sure that you're, quote, qualified to be an advocate because you don't have a formal education in nuclear or you don't feel like you have all the facts or you don't think you can uh, eloquently turn every single question that you, would ha that you could potentially be asked by someone who is not uh, a fan of nuclear, it's okay. Typically, a canvasser only gets about a 30-minute training in a typical organization like ours. We train our canvassers for two days. You guys have spent more time learning about nuclear, or, just, or roughly the equivalent amount of time in the, just at this conference, as our canvassers who go out every day and talk about nuclear. Uh, trust me, you are more than qualified. But beyond that, I, I've actually found, particularly with engineers and academics and philosophers, our, our favorite phrase, our favorite two words in the English language are, well, actually. <laughs> Again, you do, <laughs> I don't know is an acceptable answer. It's also totally acceptable to say, that's a really interesting point and I totally understand. I used to think that myself. Um, here, here's something that I found out. We, t we like to, as, as academics, as, as purveyors of information about this technology, we particularly enjoy correcting people. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop doing that. Again, if you're on a date and your date says something that's factually incorrect, I'm gonna encourage you, don't say, well, actually. Because again, I don't think the night's gonna go the way that you want it to. This is a lot of talk, and a lot of this conference has been talk, and we need this information. It's good to have all of these informational pieces. But one of the things about Generation Atomic is that we don't like just stopping at talk. We're not the only ones who've done that. Kristen and Heather have done that. Michael Schellenberger has done that. And you guys are now being invited to do that with us. You've heard a lot of this from Heather. You've heard a lot of this from Gordon, Eric, myself. It's time to stop talking about activism and actually just do it. And it's going to feel weird and it's going to feel messy. Uh, but it's also going to actually move the needle. Um, and it's going to give you something tangible that you can walk away from this conference and you can say, not only did I learn all these cool things and I see it's on Eclipse, but at the end of this last, next hour, you'll be able to say, I have written a letter to the editor to send, send for publication in my local newspaper. You'll be able to say, I have talked to the, uh, the office of my elected representative about the importance of uh, pro-nuclear legislation. And you will, you will have had an opportunity to tell your story, not someone else's story, not what you think the story, to tell your story. Hi, Meredith. Hi, Heather. <laughs> it's great to be interviewed by you. <laughs> it's great to be here yeah. with you. Another plant that I, would, I had always heard was a really amazing plant, just oh, like yeah. Diablo Canyon, the, Vermont Yankee. The little plant that could, like the yes. people who worked there called it. I mean, they had such a spirit and, and it was so well run. Mm -hmm. uh, they were being sued every other, uh, every other day. They, mm -hmm. they, they passed a law in Vermont that they had to pay a great deal more, like 12 million instead of 2 million or three million generation tax, but that tax was only for plants that were built after 1962 that were over 200 megawatts. In other words, one plant. Because the people will tell you that they're just doing this for the environment. Yeah. Oh, so I'm an environmentalist, that's why I don't want this. You like gas better? I started out very interested in geothermal energy. It was my dream job. Mm -hmm. It was being in the renewable resources group at the Electric Power Research Institute. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, everybody wants to be in the renewable group, it right? sounds pretty fun. Oh, it sounds yeah. fun. <laughs> it sounds like, yes, you're doing something. The thing is that it, it was all so small. Mm -hmm. It was all so small. I was, uh, and uh, I, I, there's only a certain number of places you can put a geothermal plant effectively. How do you get geothermal? You got to have have uh, magma underneath. Where do you find yourself in magma underneath? Oh, beautiful mountain valleys. <laughs> a friend of mine went to visit Solar One, mm -hmm. which was uh, a concentrating solar, uh, okay. uh, a very early one, okay? Yeah. And he, he, it's been closed down for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came back and he said, Meredith, I tell you, it was so weird. I saw this bird and it was flying and then all of a sudden it was a puff of smoke. He said it was so upsetting. 
But he was telling me this in something like 1983. Wow. So what I'm trying to say is that what's happening down with the solar uh, plants down in the deserts down mm -hmm. there now, people say, well, we, unexpected consequences, mm -hmm. come on. It's not really a good excuse anymore. It isn't a good excuse anymore, and it wasn't a good excuse the first time they used it, <laughs> that they didn't expect this to happen, yeah. because I expected it to happen. Yeah. It is not a magical thing, I promise you. These are people, like, these are people who... They, they live in homes, they drive cars, they do things, you can talk to them, right? They work for you, and when you tell them your story and ask them, they have to, their staff will log that, and they have to do something with that. I'd like to say, I, I worked in a congressional office for a while as an internship, but they really do log and pay attention to everything you say. If they get 40 calls in a day, they're going to take action. It is going to be rare that you are going to walk into a legislator's office and have a half hour conversation. Almost assuredly, uh, if you have a face-to-face -face interaction with a legislator, it will be a five minute meeting or two minutes in the hall. And so what we want to do is, again, quickly kind of show you what it, what it might be like if I'm, say, uh, you know, a congressman or the chief of staff to a congressman. Uh, congressman Stevenson, thank you for meeting with me today. I really oh, appreciate it. Thank, hey, not a problem. Uh, what I came to talk to you about today is H.R. 590. Okay. That's the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act. Okay. Um, so I'd really like your support for this in committee because it's, it's important to me as, as an environmentalist. Um, you know, nuclear energy is, is often not thought of the, the clean energy source that it is, but uh, it turns out that it, it actually is. Sure. <laughs> And uh, this, this particular bill would, would streamline the, regulation, the regulatory process in the NRC and make it easier for us to uh, develop the advanced reactors that we need to, to power our country, to bring the developing world out of poverty, and to recycle our existing nuclear waste. Well, I mean, you know that I'm a big energy guy, and uh, you know, I've always been supportive of different types of energy and research. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, it's definitely something I'm interested in. Are you familiar with uh, advanced nuclear reactors and that kind of technology? I, you know, I, I know that there is some research being done and that there is some money at the Department of Energy. A lot of the development here is happening overseas and we're, we might be losing some of our, our national uh, competitiveness on this issue. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Right, so I know you're a guy who, who cares uh, passionately about uh, Amer American supremacy, and, and also I know you, you don't I want... I do believe we need to make America great again. All right, great. Well, this is a fantastic way to do that, because this bill would uh, knock down some of the regulations that, that have been uh, slowing the approval of the designs that we need to do this. Yep. Um, so when, when it comes to a vote, can I count on your support for H.R. 590? I, I, you know, I, I, I will have to take a look at it, but I, I, at this point, I think you can count on my support, yes. Okay, great. Well, thank I have, uh, thanks so much yeah, for Yeah, thank you for coming in. You bet. And I want to know, um, I can be a resource to you if you have any more questions, and here's some information I'm going to leave with you. Thank you. I really appreciate right. that. Two most important things that Eric did. Number one, he asked me if I could support it, and what did I, the first time I answered, I just said, well, I'm an energy guy. Now, a typical person would say, you know, if, if you asked anyone you know, like walking out of that conversation, how did the congressman feel about the bill? Oh, he loved it, he's really, that's not what I said. What I said is I'm an energy supporter, right? So what Eric did is at the end, he came back and, sa and specifically said, can I count on your vote? And I it, just, you know, for the sake of time, I said, yes, you can count on my support. Unless you hear, yes, you can count on my vote, that is not a yes. Right, and then you, you, so you either A, want to push for a firm answer, or leave yourself open as a resource. And that, and that was another, that's a great little pro, to, pro move is to have a lead behind. You don't give it to the person initially. That was another great thing Eric did. He doesn't give it to me, because otherwise I'm just going to be reading it as opposed to listening to him. But now I have something to remember. The other thing that Eric did extremely well is he related it to something that he knew that I was passionate about. He linked it to my values. Certainly I understand that Eric was passionate about it and I understood why he was, but he really got me when he linked it back to why I should care about it and why I should care about it for my constituents, one of whom I, presumably is Eric. Most likely you would have really have said, leave it with my staff or yep. give it, and that would be the, the next opening to be sure to follow up. Yep. Whether it's a staff person that you're talking to or an, or an actual elected official, give them the opportunity to say yes or no. 
and get and make them make them declare uh, declare a stance. That's that that's simply my that's the the point that we want to try to make is it's it, the way you go from you know someone who's just someone who's just there talking about it to an to an advocate who is making substantive policy points is by basically forcing the hand. I'm uh, Alistair Lumsden. Uh, I'm from the London in the UK. My previous career, I'm working in the technology industry and sure you're uh, helping people um, you know, have, have livelihoods, but you're not going to save lives. You're not necessarily going to make a big impact in the world. And this kind of work, I, I feel, does have a, a real positive impact. It's really for me about energy density, uh, you know, wind and renewable are uh, diffuse sources of energy. If CO2 wasn't an issue, you could just keep burning, uh, you know, fossil fuels. We need solutions, we need them fast, and uh, yeah, uh, nuclear is available today. Ring, ring, ring. Uh, hello, Senator Franken's office. Oh, hi there. Uh, my name's Eric Meyer. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm one of, one of the senator's constituents. Um, I'm calling today because uh, I wanted to express my support for H.R. 590, uh, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act. I know the, the senator is on the Energy Committee. I'd really appreciate his support for this particular bill as it would help bring clean energy to Minnesota and the country at large and help us fight climate change. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure where the senator stands on it at the exact moment. Uh, is there any information that you can provide to me or a website that I can give to the senator? Uh, certainly, I can, uh, I can email you a, a one pager on the document that you can pass along. What's, uh, what, what's a good email? Senator.franken at us.senate.gov. I will do that and uh, yeah, I look forward to, to hearing back from you soon about the senator's support. Thank you, sir. I, I've, I've logged your call and I'll make sure that the senator gets the information. Great, thank you so much. It really is that simple. Eric? started by introducing himself, saying where he's from. If you are a constituent, definitely highlight the fact that you are in their district, that you, you know, if you voted for them, for example, uh, if you're a supporter of the, of the senator, you can say, I voted for the senator and I, and, I, and I really believe that the senator is a strong leader on this issue. Rather than going on and on and on and on, he cut it off at about 15, 20 seconds, gave me an opportunity to ask any questions, and sure enough, He's there with a tangible piece of information that he can follow up with and develop that relationship. I know, I know it sounds crazy, but it really is just that simple. Um, just be yourselves and talk about what you're passionate about. Type in atomic action in your search bar there and you will find our app. It's two button presses and you're gonna be on the phone with your particular senator. Call senators to support NEMA. And when I click that, It'll give you a, a, a brief script that you can just kind of internalize because once you start calling, it, it'll go away. But this one in particular says, it says, hi, this is Eric from, insert town, St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm calling to ask Senator so-and-so. It'll tell you which name. i will just say whatever you like. If you want to make it more about molten salt reactor specifically, totally fine. Um, but that, that is it. So once you download that, you click here to call. Once that happens, we might all kind of want to turn around and wander into a corner <laughs> for a little, little peace and quiet. Basically, a letter to the editor is um, a statement from you as a person, as a constituent, that this is something that you think is important and that they should publish content about. You can write your name, contact information, and the name of your local paper, and we're going to actually take the letters and type them up and send them off for you. So this should be really short, maybe under 150 words. The ones that get published are the ones that um, really drive home why your voice needs to be heard. It's a way to get to a, a different constituency. I mean, we can get certain people through social media, and then there's other people who read the newspaper all the time, you know? It's the only way to get to my grandparents, that's for sure. I started out working in coal plants. I had the opportunity to work in nuclear plants. Not kidding at all. Not kidding at all. Are you kidding me? No, not at all. I was, I was a welding inspector, and I, I had worked in a coal plant. I went to work in a nuclear plant. And the level of professionalism amongst those people that worked in nuclear power, it gave me goosebumps. It gives, it's given me goosebumps to, to talk about it right now. I, I thought, I want to do what they do. How do I get that job? I went back to school. Even a lay person doing this cursory research, I, I started to realize that there was no reason that nuclear didn't function, right? I was very comfortable. Uh, I went back to school and I got my nuclear engineering degree uh, and graduated in May. How do you lift people out of, out of poverty? And, uh, and how do you make them, how do you provide them enough energy so they can lead healthy, productive lives? So that's very important to me. The magnitude of the problem on the other side is so large, 
only nuclear has a shot. We have the privilege to be able to make these choices in other places maybe don't. You know, not, not every place can turn, flip the switch and be a UAE, you know, and suddenly be building reactors like they're, they're going out of style. If we put one of those in Haiti, it would provide all of the power for them at the same level that a New Yorker can, can enjoy, right? With, that, with, with one reactor, with one boring, run-of-the-mill, 60s-style reactor. I think everybody in here has felt the frustration, the frustration of knowing what molten salt reactors and Gen 4 nuclear technology are capable of, uh, but, but how very few people know that. Very few people know that. Even less know what to do. And like was said earlier today, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. You were the first step to helping us do this. Everybody in this room to uh, help us uh, push federal Gen 4 legislation. That, that was amazing. And we're also looking at lifting the 14 nuclear moratoria on the books. Over the next you know, years, we're gonna to try to stop the bleeding. We're gonna to try to save the existing nuclear plants and try to, to pass clean energy standards that include nuclear in them to, to fix some of the, the economic imbalances that we have. We have a strategy for educational programs, a school outreach program. We're working in partnership with an organization that makes games for summer camps. I'm an organizer for Gen A, but I sometimes get roped into other random projects. We got our nuclear plant, desalination plant. The future of energy needs to be exciting, it's brightly colored, it's hopeful, and above all, it's possible. And they have to be the ones to achieve um, the end of the game, which is completing the puzzle. It's no secret that the most watched videos on YouTube are often the shortest. Coming out with 15 short videos, less than a minute long, that detail the applications of advanced nuclear energy. Synthesizing carbon neutral synthetic fuels, uh, combined heat and power, desalination, the medical isotopes, uh, cogeneration with renewables, exploring space, things that talk about the positives of, the, of a world with a lot of nuclear energy. Now we have our first video in near completion. That is the first video in a series of 15 that covers uh, a lot of ground on how, how we can bring a, a very positive future for, for all people, all humans, not just us in the rich world here. Everybody here got a chance, I think, to download the app. To wrap this thing up, um, I just want to say how, how thrilled I am to see the grit and bravery and determination, I guess, through all of these different, different activities we had. We, people had to get out of their comfort zones and people just embraced it wholeheartedly because we know how important this issue to us, uh, this issue is to us. So, um, so, so thank you. I mean, you guys deserve a, a round of applause just for your participation. Incredible. Thanks for sticking it out. It's great. And, uh, and I think I'm, I'm going to just sing us out with one more song. Uh, it's, it's called The Impossible Dream. And I think, you know, we've all, we've all been dreaming it. And we, we understand that the stakes are so high. And uh, the, the world needs us to, to give ourselves to this cause. So I'm going to sing, sing one more tune. <coughs> <laughs> to dream. The impossible dream <laughs> to fight 
the unbeatable foe, to bear with unbearable sorrow, to run where the brave dare not go, to right the unrightable wrong, to love fear and chased from afar, to try when your arms are too weary, <laughs> to reach the unreachable star. This is our quest to follow that star, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far, to fight for what's right without question or pause, to be willing to march into hell for a heavenly cause. And I know if we'll only be true to this glorious quest, that our hearts will lie peaceful and calm when we're laid to our rest. And the world will be better for this. That all of us, right? That all of us, scorned and covered with scars, still strove with our last ounce of courage to reach the unreachable stars. <laughs> Bravo! Woo! All right, Robbie. Bravo! Nice. Woo! All right. <laughs> When you become so committed that you're willing to spend days and thousands of your own dollars to come here and to learn about how to do outreach and to learn what the state of the technology is, and when you're sacrificing that much of your own personal fortune and the precious time you have on earth to ostensibly go out and spread the word and help others, it's not trite to say that if thorium is the future of energy, then all of you are the future of energy, and all of you are valuable and quite valued members of the Thorium Energy Alliance. And thank you very much, and go forth and conquer. I call this meeting to a close. <laughs>